Okay, in our video series of gastroenterology lectures, in this video, we are going to talk about primary sclerosing cholangitis. In my previous video, we talked about primary biliary cirrhosis. Now, in this video, we are going to talk about primary sclerosing cholangitis. First of all, we have a case here, a 32-year-old man comes to the clinic complaining of fatigue and pruritus. Doctor, I have this itching all over my body. It's worse at night. Doctor, I have severe fatigue. I have pain in my abdomen. He points out to the right upper quadrant. When you examine this patient, you find out that the patient is having jaundice. The patient is having tenderness in the right upper quadrant. You do liver function tests. In the liver function tests, the ALT and AST are more mildly elevated, but the ALP and gamma glutamyl transferases are highly elevated. A, an obstructive cholestatic pattern in a young male. Virology is negative. This is a classical presentation of primary sclerosing cholangitis. What is primary sclerosing cholangitis? How does it present? Today we are going to talk about that. Primary sclerosing cholangitis is an autoimmune disease characterized by inflammation and fibrosis as well as stricturing of the intra as well as extra hepatic bile ducts. Basically bile ducts drain the bile from the liver into the intestines. Now when these intra and extra hepatic bile ducts are damaged the immune system damages these bile ducts resulting in fibrosis and stricturing of these ducts that is called as primary sclerosing cholangitis. Now remember in primary biliary cirrhosis it was just the intrahepatic ducts that were affected. In primary sclerosing cholangitis both intra and extrahepatic ducts both of them are affected that is called as primary sclerosing cholangitis. Now, it, it affects males much more than females to ratio 1. As compared to primary biliary cirrhosis, primary biliary cirrhosis mainly affects young females while primary sclerosing cholangitis mainly affects the males. So these are the main differences. Primary biliary cirrhosis involves intrahepatic ducts while primary sclerosing involves both intra and extrahepatic ducts. And the median age of the patients is 40 years. Now the cause of primary sclerosing cholangitis is not known. We do not know the cause, but it is associated with ulcerative colitis. 90% of the patients with ulcerative colitis have primary sclerosing cholangitis. If a patient of inflammatory bowel disease is having elevated LFTs, must look out for primary sclerosing cholangitis in these patients. So in primary sclerosing cholangitis, there is inflammation and destruction of both intra and extrahepatic ducts. Intra and extrahepatic ducts are draining the bile from the liver into the intestines. When the bile is not drained from the in a liver into the intestines, that bile will be built up in the blood. Whenever there are increased level of bile in blood, that will result in fatigue, that will result in all the pruritus, the signs and symptoms that the patient experiences. Now remember, bile also takes toxins in it to the intestines where these toxins are removed in the feces where these toxins are excreted in the feces now whenever there is cholestasis whenever there is blockage of the bile flow from the liver to the intestine that that bile will leak into blood and that will result in buildup of toxins in the body as well as in the liver because liver cannot excrete these toxins now Toxins will accumulate in liver and they will induce damage. They will cause liver cirrhosis. Therefore, the patients will have tender right upper quadrant. Liver cirrhosis will occur. The common clinical presentation of primary sclerosing cholangitis is the patients will have fatigue, patient will have pruritus. Pruritus occurs because these bile acids cannot be excreted and they build up in blood. They deposit in the skin. When they deposit in the skin, they cause itching. Jaundice, bilirubin cannot be excreted in bile now. Pale stools because bile contain pigments that give stools their normal color. When the bile is absent in the stools, the color of the stool is pale and that bile is being built up in the blood. Therefore, it will be excreted from the kidneys resulting in dark urine. The patients experience hyperpigmentation due to an idiopathic mechanism. There is increased production of melanin in these patients. These patients have, will have damage to the liver. Whenever there is damage to the liver, the lipid metabolism is also disturbed. The lipid accumulation in the uh, lipids start to deposit in various tissues resulting in xanthomas to appear. 
poor digestion because the bile that is secreted into intestine causes digestion and emulsification of fats whenever the emulsification of fats does not take place those poorly digested fats would go out the patient will experience diarrhea these patients will have loss of fat soluble vitamins deficiency of fat soluble vitamins like vitamin a d e k these patients are therefore at risk of osteoporosis hepatosplenomegaly damage to the liver take place whenever damage to the liver take place cirrhosis will take place that cirrhosis will cause portal hypertension that will result in splenomegaly initially there will be hepatosplenomegaly in the later stages these liver will shrink now to make the diagnosis of primary sclerosing cholangitis there are a few things that should be present elevated liver enzymes the ALP and gamma glutamyl transferase alkaline phosphatase and GGT are present in the ducts that drain the bile from the liver into the intestines whenever there is damage to these ducts there will be elevated ALP elevated gamma glutamyl transferase but the ALT and AST are present in the liver cells not in the ducts therefore they are mildly elevated conjugated bilirubin will be high because it cannot be drained into the intestines with elevated liver enzyme bile duct structures will be seen on mrcp ercp mrcp is magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatography what they, what they do in mrcp is they get inside the gut they reach the ampulla of vitre where there is opening of bile duct into the intestines and then they pass a scope they give a dye and that dye travel through the uh, bile ducts and they take a picture now when you give a dye in these patients with primary sclerosis and cholangitis the dye cannot travel properly and it will it will it will be difficult for the dye to travel because there is fibrosis and strictures of these ducts therefore on mrcp you will see bile duct strictures what is mrcp mrcp is the technique in which you take picture in which you give a dye to these ducts and you see the travel of the dye and take pictures in ERCP, ERCP is a similar procedure but ERCP is a therapeutic procedure as well in which you go inside these ducts and then you open up the strictures that are causing obstruction. So MRCP is a diagnostic procedure. ERCP is diagnostic as well as therapeutic procedure in which you open up the strictures. And the third most important thing is that you have excluded other causes. So it is mostly an exclusion criteria where you see elevated liver enzyme, the cholestatic and pattern and you see bile duct strictures and fibrosis on MRCP. Now, now if you look at this animated picture, these are the bile ducts and these bile ducts are draining into the intestines. Now what they do in MRCP is they get over here and they put a dye and that dye travels over here and you can see the structure. This is a picture showing normal duct pattern. These are the extra hepatic ducts and these are the ducts that are present in the liver. Look at the beautiful amazing duct pattern. All the ducts are normal and fine. Now if you see this picture, in this picture you cannot appreciate those ducts properly because those intrahepatic ducts are damaged. If you compare it with the previous picture, beautiful ducts. Over here you cannot see the ducts now. Now look at the extrahepatic ducts. Over here the extrahepatic ducts are smooth and beautiful. Over here if you see the extrahepatic ducts, the extrahepatic ducts are having stricture, bead-like pattern. The structures are there. Fibrosis has taken place. Some places it's dilated. Some places it is constricted. So you see this pattern over here. This is primary sclerosing cholangitis. So this is a technique called as MRCP where you give a dye and take pictures and see the travel of the dye. And it shows you the strictures and damage of the ducts. In ERCP, you get inside, you also dilate these strictures. It is a therapeutic procedure as well. Now for diagnosis, MRCP is enough. You do not need ERCP because ERCP can, poses its own risk. It can induce cholangitis. It can cause pancreatitis. Therefore, ERCP is usually not used. It's only used when you want to open up the strictures that are causing obstruction. MRCP is magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatography. It is a method of choice. If there is no biliary obstruction, then you use MRCP for diagnosis. ERCP is endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. It is used whenever there is biliary obstruction and you want to open up that biliary obstruction to relieve the symptom. In that case, you go for ERCP. But remember, it poses a risk of ERCP-induced pancreatitis as well as cholangitis.
If you see elevated liver function tests in a patient with a history of inflammatory bowel disease, very easy. Remember, suspect primary sclerosing cholangitis in these patients. Strong association. There are few diseases that have strong associations with each other. Like giant cell arthritis is associated with polymyalgia rheumatica. Very strong association. Ulcerative colitis is strongly associated with primary sclerosing cholangitis. Must remember these. Pianka antibodies are positive in 80% of the cases. These are not used for the diagnosis, but these can help you hint toward the diagnosis. So primary sclerosing cholangitis has a bit of a confusing diagnosis where you take many of the supportive things and you collect the evidence and then you say that, okay, this is primary sclerosing cholangitis when you have excluded all other causes. So unlike... Um, primary biliary cirrhosis in primary biliary cirrhosis anti-mitochondrial antibodies uh, were there that we were using for the diagnosis over here pnk antibodies are there these are present in 80 percent of the cases but these are not very specific that this is primary sclerosing cholangitis so they can be a supportive thing that you can add to the collection of evidences that you are collecting igg4 antibodies should also be done in these patients with primary sclerosing cholangitis because if these are positive it means that the patient is having igg4 positive sclerosing cholangitis this is rapidly progressive but the good thing is that it responds to corticosteroids so if igg4 is positive you give corticosteroids in these cases of primary sclerosing cholangitis this should be done in patients who are diagnosed to have primary sclerosing cholangitis Liver biopsy can give you the diagnosis, but it is not usually done. It is only done when the imaging is insufficient. When you, when there is small duct primary sclerosing cholangitis that is involving the small duct, but the bigger ducts are fine on MRCP. On MRCP, there is no evidence, but the liver function tests show elevated uh, ALP and gamma glutamyl transferase. In that case scenario, you are confused. In that case, you can go for liver biopsy. It can show you concentric periductal onion skin fibrosis, which is actually a pattern where there is repeated cycle of fibrosis that cause uh, layers and layers and layers of fibrosis so that is called as an onion skin fibrosis or if you suspect that there is an overlap of autoimmune hepatitis and primary sclerosing cholangitis when will you suspect that there is an overlap of autoimmune hepatitis and primary sclerosing cholangitis if there is elevated alt and ast alt and ast are highly elevated with uh, highly elevated ALP and uh, gamma glutamyl transferase in a patient in which you are suspecting primary sclerosing cholangitis. It means that there is inflammation in the ducts as well as inflammation in the liver. So in that case, you can also suspect an overlap of autoimmune hepatitis with primary sclerosing cholangitis. In that case, liver biopsy can help you finding out both the diseases. But remember, liver biopsy is not a preferred. It's mainly the MRCP that is used as well as the enzymes and exclusion of other criteria for making the diagnosis of primary sclerosing cholangitis. This is a picture showing onion skin fibrosis in a patient with primary sclerosing cholangitis. Now coming to the treatment and management of primary sclerosing cholangitis. In the treatment, ursodeoxycholic acid can be used but unlike primary biliary cirrhosis where it is a first line management and it actually works and improves primary biliary cirrhosis, in primary sclerosing cholangitis, ursodeoxycholic acid has a limited role. It is not shown to improve the patient condition. It just normalizes a bit of the LFTs but it does not slow progression of the patient's condition to cirrhosis no chance the mainstay of treatment in primary sclerosing cholangitis is liver transplant and liver transplant is done in patients with decompensated cirrhosis if the meld score is greater than 14 what is meld score we'll talk about that in a in our video on liver cirrhosis it's basically a scoring criteria to see the level of cirrhosis in a patient now you'll be thinking that it's just a symptomatic management. It's basically symptomatic management, symptomatic management of uh, uh, liver function test normalizing with arsodeoxycholic acid. If there is cholestasis, you treat cholestasis with cholestyramine, reduce the itching. You do ERCP if there is any dilation and blockage of the ducts, you go and open up those strictures. And if, uh, if it is an IgG4 associated cholangitis, then you give gluto glucocorticoids because it responds to glucocorticoids. It's mainly symptomatic management in primary sclerosing cholangitis and liver transplant is the mainstay of treatment in primary sclerosing cholangitis patients. 
Now coming to the complications. The complications include malignancy, cholangiocarcinoma, because there is chronic inflammation, ongoing inflammation in the bile ducts. It can pose the risk of cholangiocarcinoma in these patients. Patients are at increased risk of colorectal cancer because most of the, these patients, 90% of these patients have inflammatory bowel disease as well. Therefore, these patients are at risk of col colorectal cancer. I have full videos on ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease on my YouTube channel. You can check out those videos as well. Since these patients cannot digest fats because the bile cannot reach the intestines, bile cannot emulsify the fats, therefore you, do, you will see steatorrhea. In steatorrhea, there will be loss of fats in stools. Whenever there is loss of fats in stools, the fat soluble vitamins like A, D, E, K will be lost. The patient will develop deficiencies of these. Liver cirrhosis is also a complication of primary sclerosing cholangitis. Before going into the summary, if you liked my video, please make sure to click the subscribe button. Make sure to check out my other lectures on emergency medicine, ECG lectures, my videos on neurology lectures. All those playlists are available on my uh, YouTube channel as well as in the description below. We talked about what is primary sclerosing cholangitis and the differences from primary biliary cirrhosis, the causes, association, strong association with inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, uh, the symptoms, fatigue and pruritus being the most important one. Then we talked about elevated liver enzyme, bile duct structure seen on MRCP and exclusion of other criteria. That is how we make the diagnosis. What is MRCP? What is ERCP? What, is, what are the differences? Elevated LFTs in a patient with inflammatory bowel disease suspect primary sclerosing cholangitis. PNK supportive in diagnosis. IgG4 must be tested, treat with steroids. Liver biopsy can be done if there is a small duct a disease. Liver biopsy can also be done in patients in which you suspect overlap syndrome of autoimmune hepatitis and primary sclerosing cholangitis. Ursodeoxycholic acid, limited evidence of use, mainstay of treatment is liver transplant. Symptomatic management is usually done. Complications include malignancy, steatorrhea, liver cirrhosis, high risk of cholangiocarcinoma in these patients. If you like my video, please click on the subscribe button. Thank you very much.